I'm with you, Tim. We got to We got to We got to That that's all. I guess I'm gonna tell them all those things when they finally uh, let me in. All right, are you ready? <laughs> okay, great. All right, guys, what's up? We're here at the Artisan Podcast, and I have a really special guest today, Mr. Timothy Coughlin. Thanks for coming in. Of course, thanks for I appreciate me. it. Uh, just a little background. I uh, stalked DePaul's website and found Timmy, Timothy, and uh, he agreed to come in. And I first ran into him at the Jamie Abersole uh, Jazz Camp back in 2006. So that'll give you a little uh, insight into how old we are. And, um, I was 25 then. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Exactly, and uh, big shout out to Jamie Abersole for being so dedicated to jazz education for all these years. Yes, man. amazing. Yeah, I don't. Is there a, is there a jazz hall of fame? Do you know uh, of one? There might be some in Kansas City. Yeah, maybe. I think well, there's one in Kansas City. Well, wh where, whenever, wherever that is, you need to put Jamie in. Sure. If for nothing else, then we've all heard him count one, two, three, four a bunch of times. <laughs> he just turned eighty. Jesus Christ, man! Is he still playing basketball? I know that was a real big thing for him, man. He finally stopped playing a couple years ago. He oh, was still man. playing pretty recently. Yeah, he would still send us silly emails about how he made twenty five right. foul shots in a row. Right, 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 right. I, I would ask him if there were any witnesses to this. <laughs> right, right. But I, I know he can do that. Jamie, we, we need video, man. This is twenty nineteen, dog. You know, you can't just be telling people. <laughs> but um, so um, I know a little bit about you, but we're gonna, you know, have them learn a, a little bit about you. Uh, what got you into the trombone? Well, I started playing in fourth grade, and. Uh, I lived in Dallas, Texas at that point, and uh, I played piano up here a couple of years. My mm -hmm. mom made me take piano lessons. Thanks, Mom. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah of course. Yeah, of absolutely. Course. Absolutely. And I have this recollection of like passing some kind of test at the school, and then I was allowed to join band, mm -hmm. and the band was terrible, so I don't remember of course. why we'd have to pass a test. Right. So I came home, and I told my mother, showed her this piece of paper, and she said, well, Oh, what do you want to play? I right. Said, I have no idea. Right, right, right. She goes, how about the trombone? I'm like, mm -hmm. what's the trombone? And she had one in the closet. She played the trombone. Really? I had never seen it. I was, you know, whatever, 10 or 11 years old. And yeah. She got this old con, I think it's a con quest mm -hmm. or a constellation. And it's actually a great horn. Nice. And uh, I, I took right to it. Mm -hmm. Okay, buzz your lips. Let's try a middle. Right, line. right, right, and right. Decent sound out. And yeah, man. Flat. And I started in fourth grade. In, in Dallas, I lived in actually in South Oak Cliff in Dallas, okay. in Dallas, Texas. So I was at Robert L. Thornton Elementary School in fourth grade. In this very sad band, but mm -hmm. it was fun. Honestly, that is about as close to my exact same experience that happened. Yeah. When I guess I had no idea what a trombone was. I asked for a trumpet or a saxophone, and I think I was the last person to show up to get the instruments. And all the instruments had been given out, and I had I got I got stuck with the trombone. But yeah, the band was terrible, man. But <laughs> I'm glad it worked out that way. Basically paid for my college education, so. <laughs> That's good. Thanks, Mom. Appreciate it. <laughs> Appreciate it. So from there, um, when did you start to kind of get serious about it? Because you kind of go through the motions for a while, you know, but your mom was a trombone player, so maybe that was different. I don't know about serious, but mm -hmm. I kept, I started playing, you know, all through uh, elementary school, middle school, high school. Yeah. We moved to uh, uh, Baltimore, Maryland, actually that year in fourth wow. grade. Wow, yeah. And we Park when I was in 10th, 10th grade. My dad switched jobs a couple times. He was okay. a Presbyterian minister. And both moves were great because I moved into a better school system and then nice. better music programs. Mm -hmm. And uh, I guess serious, you know, I thought I was serious in high school. Probably. Right, right, but, right. You know, looking back, of course, you wish you had worked harder. Absolutely. Practiced harder. So, yeah, and I realized I didn't really have much interest as far as anything realistically major in college. Right, right. I understand. You know, so I was fortunate that it all worked out. Great. So going to summer camps, mm -hmm. like we were just discussing, you being in the Ravinia program right. and meeting other people who could play better than you. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, you always tell students you want to get out of your comfort zone of your school band and go meet people and do stuff and see where you really. Right. So I went to a lot of summer camps. Right. And that was always a reality check. And it is a reality check. A lot of fun, but reality check, like, oh, wow. Yeah, can, these yeah, guys man. and gals can really play. And I. There's some competition out here besides my little high school right. section. Right, exactly. You know, so I was fortunate to have some good experiences with all that stuff, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, man, there's some monsters out here. There's some real, there's some real child savants, man, uh, musically, just 
kind of exist. And I don't, and so some of them don't even come from musical families. They just kind of just do the thing, you know. Well, uh, you're a young guy, but I think mm -hmm. a lot of that has to do with all the incredible technology now. My, Absolutely. All, my old guy friends talk mm -hmm. about the, the line in the sand with the YouTube generation. Absolutely. So I'm seeing people who are 18 play like they're 21, or if they're 21, they play like Fact. they're 25. So right. all of the, the level is, is getting so much higher, so much quicker. Yes. And I think a lot of it's because of the access to you know, the music itself, but also through videos. You can learn right. a lot watching someone play too, not just listening to them. A absolutely, man. You know, we are we, we definitely are. I'm a car guy. And, you know, I don't know when I realized it, but I kind of realized, like, man, we're in a like, golden age of cars right now. You know what I mean? Like, it's kind of hard to buy a bad car. Right. You know, you can get a performance car, like a real performance car, for almost nothing now. Uh -huh. And this, the same is true sort of for, like, information, you know, uh, YouTube has become the great equalizer right. in, in a lot of things. You know, I didn't know anything about cameras or about podcasting or about any of this stuff, you know. Right. And for about 45 days, I just was on YouTube looking up everything. Right. And by the end of it, I knew what camera to get. I knew how to work it. I knew, I knew all of these things. And uh, I always call the Internet like the wild, wild west, you know what I mean? And everybody has a gun. And really, I didn't even need to get this camera. I could have just went and got a nice phone. You know what I mean? It's just kind of set it up and just, just sure. went, man. So, no, I'm with you. You're right. Um, there are more books out now about how to play and all these different types of A2 books. You know, it's, it's, it's weird. You, I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll never say that you don't need a teacher because teachers will lower the learning curve like a thousand percent. But the absolute need for a teacher, at least to get started, Man, you know, it's it, it's changed. So even as a teacher, and I know you do instruct, um, what you need to deliver or maybe even how you go about teaching is different now. Have you felt that from your students? Do they do the YouTube thing? Do they kind of seek out music on YouTube? Because you used to have to buy CDs and go and listen to these things. You had to invest money, you know. Now all you need is the Internet or a phone. You can just kind of, yeah. oh, man, I can watch, you know, uh, uh, Ian Boosfeld videos or Joel Essie videos for hours and hours, yeah, you know. It's amazing. Yeah, 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 yeah. Have you have you felt that 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 change as a teacher? Oh yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. So a lot of stuff is online, like you just described. If you have a favorite player or teacher, they probably got a lot of stuff online. Yeah. To listen to, <clears throat> to watch. Yeah, some of the instruction videos are right. incredible. Mm -hmm. So when you watch somebody give an hour long trombone playing, you know, right? Some festival and it's great. Right. And when I was younger, mm -hmm. you know, your age. Or right, 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 right. You know, really, it's really amazing. Mm -hmm. So, I, absolutely. And students are showing me stuff all the time. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, because like, they're probably on it more than you check are. Check this out. Tim, I just saw this, man. They could turn the computer on and you sit there and watch something. It's like, oh, my gosh. So, it's part of the fun of teaching. When you still absolutely. Learn. I learn a lot from the students. You know, sometimes I feel like I'm getting better. Yeah. <laughs> they are. Yeah, man, learning goes both ways, absolutely. For sure. Absolutely. So have you have you yourself thought about um expanding your uh uh teaching portfolio by maybe putting up some things on YouTube? Is that something you've kind of given any real thought to? Um yeah, I have thought about it. I mean I have a website and I I'm gonna you know, have a artist clinician thing with a sure a, a trombone company, brass company. Mm -hmm. And um uh, but there's so many out there. Yeah. You know, so I'm not you sure. You throw your hat in the ring, though. Yeah, man. I know. That's the thing. No, that's the thing. No, man, it's weird yeah. because, you know, it's, 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 somebody made an example. I think I was reading some business book or something like that. And when you go to the store, there's 50 different kinds of bread. But you probably buy the same bread every time you go to the store, right? Pretty much. Yeah, yeah me too. I've been buying, my grandmother bought the same bread, my mom buys that bread, and now I buy that bread. And, you know, I'm sure those other breads are great. And I, the company that I, I buy it from, they, uh, they also have different types of bread. But I don't, even, I don't even look at that, you know. Right. So maybe, you know, you just need to have your bread on the aisle. And maybe somebody will come check it out, man. <laughs> hey, it's, it's, I don't no, know. it's true. I, I, I'm an artist clinician for XO Brass, which is a pro line of Jupiter Instruments. Okay. And they just sent me a thing last week mm -hmm. to fill out my artist page. Yeah. And. You have a YouTube page. Mm. And I'm like, oh my God. I hope you shoot some video. I never, 
No, but I mean, I've watched yeah. videos of me already on, right? Uh, you know, that are on YouTube, so mm -hmm. I wish they weren't on YouTube. Right, but right, right. I understand that me too. Me playing with some sad middle school. Band, so. <laughs> yeah. Right. But like, you know, you. so I'm. It's on my list of stuff to do before school starts. Yeah. So should I pick up videos or things I'm on mm -hmm. that I like that are on my YouTube page? Mm -hmm. So it's something I need to do, you know, in the next week or two. For sure, man. So kind of to your point. Yeah. So yeah. Like I said, if you want some new video, I won't even charge you. <laughs> Just because you came and helped me out, I'll, I'll come in. We'll get it. We'll get a nice mic set up and everything like that. But, you know, we're, we're out here playing and performing, and it's a very, you know, public thing. But yes. Then, like, in some ways, we're hesitant to be doing self-promotion. You know what? But it's because it's, so embar it's, it's embarrassing. It's not my personality to do that, but, it, but it's so necessary. It is. Especially now, like what you're talking about. Absolutely it is. And what you just said, if you guys don't know, uh, music and art is a very, very personal thing. Yeah. And to even go on stage and play with all your friends in the perfect scenario, you know, maybe you're not thinking about it quite as much, but it's absolutely nerve wracking. But then when somebody asks you to like, hey man, I want you to be like, what we have to go and do like our own thing and self promote. I don't know what that blockage is that exists for us because it's almost true for probably ninety five percent of us. Some of us have. Irrational confidence, and it does that. It does. It does. It does them a service for sure. But most of us, I don't know why we're so paralyzed by this act of um, promotion that's absolutely necessary for us to be successful. You know. So I, I, I need to figure out what that is. In, in, in maybe that, maybe, maybe that's the clinic I should teach. Maybe that's where we, maybe that's where we need to make money, so we can teach artists. Right. How to get over themselves, you know, and yeah. actually do the thing that we're good at doing. Yeah. Well, plus, it takes time. It it does take I'd time. Play my trombone and have to work on promoting myself. Uh, yeah, I know, man. But it, you know, it's real easy to sit in a practice room all day. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? For sure. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I'm gonna figure that out. That's that's the next thing on my list, man. I <laughs> hopefully a psychiatrist sees this and they're like, oh, I can help with that. <laughs> Boom. Thank you. Let's get it. Let's get it going. But um. Sports psychiatry is a thing. They do that with a lot of athletes. You know, sure. they, uh, Greg Maddox actually, this is the same Greg Maddox that won four straight Cy Youngs with the Cubs and then they let him go to the race. Uh, they, he, there was an interview where when he was coming up through the minors, and you know, he was a top pick and everything like that. They knew he was going to be a great pitcher. Maybe not 300 game winner, Greg Maddox, but they thought, man, we got a real chance. This guy could be an ace. Right. And he was struggling a lot. And one of the things that he talked about was he went and saw a sports psychiatrist. Wow. And the guy asked him, well, what, what did you talk about? What was, you know, what did he say? And he said, he just taught me how to like myself. And at the time, I didn't really understand. Like, man, the Greg Maddox I saw in all the interviews and like that, I liked him just fine. He seemed like a great guy, you know. Yeah, absolutely. But maybe there was something within him that didn't allow him to be confident. When he was out there on the mound, he maybe he was second guessing himself. Maybe you know his two seam fastball wasn't breaking as much in the game as much as he thought it was when he was pitching. You know what I mean? That kind of thing. And maybe that's the same thing that we deal with. Maybe we start to feel like our sound isn't what we think it is, and maybe we don't think that uh, uh, we deserve to be there. I've heard that from 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 musicians as well. Well, do I deserve to have an audience and things like that? You know, have you dealt with that? Is that something that, that goes through your mind? Oh, of course. I, I think a part of it. My wife's a musician, also. Oh, okay, great, we, great. We laugh about uh, being hypersensitive people, mm -hmm. so I think that hypersensitive element to our personality can have a play a big part of what you're talking about. Absolutely. So, yeah, for sure. Am I playing well enough? Do I sound good enough? Right. Is everyone gonna like how I sound? Right. Are my, are my chops working? You know, mm -hmm. trombone is a humbling. God, difficult man. instrument to play, and you can't lay off. And, you can't. You know, and then you're worried, especially now that I'm old. Mm -hmm. you really got to not lay off. Right, right, right. So yeah, right. But I think all that plays a part. Absolutely, man. Absolutely. So, when where did you go to school after 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 high school? I went to Indiana University School of Music. Were you there with David Baker? I was. How was that experience? Oh, incredible! Not, yeah. only, not only David, who was of course an icon, but the whole school had lots of teachers like him. Wow. It was a huge, you know, 1,600 student uh, music school. Jesus. I think the biggest one, one of the biggest Jesus. ones. Jesus, 1,600 students. Yeah, it's gigantic. Yeah. And uh, I studied with trombone with Keith Brown. He had played in Philadelphia. Okay. Orchestra under Eugene Ormandy, and he played in the Met in New York. Mm -hmm. You know, 
all the teachers were like that. They all had those kind of wow. credentials. And David, yeah. David had his own, you know, incredible role as well. So yeah, it was great. I played in his band for four years and mm -hmm. lead trombone several years. Nice, was great, incredible. What a teacher, a jazz history teacher, a jazz improvisation teacher, yeah, a combo teacher, a big band teacher, and of course writing and composing. Right. I just I just over the summer read Dexter Gordon's book that Maxine Gordon, his wife, had written about him, mm -hmm. and one of David's first big composition assignments to get him some real note of writing was a piece called Ellen Tones. Mm. And Dexter had just done the uh, Round Midnight movie. Nice, yeah, man. And then they were nice. trying to capitalize on his popularity. Of course. And, and he got, a, got an Academy Award nomination for the role. Yeah. And right after that, David got the commission to write Ellen Tones, and it was for, uh, for uh, Dexter to play with the New York Philharmonic. Wow. And Herbie Hancock played yeah. piano, and maybe Ron Carter on bass. It was a rhythm section and Dexter. So I was just reading about this this the last few weeks, and I was re remembering that that was 87, 1987, my senior year of college, and uh, we were all so happy for David. It was such a, Absolutely. Such a big deal. And that really propelled his, his mm -hmm. composition thing he was trying to get going. Right. And I remember later seeing him, he goes, yeah, I've got composition assignments five years out. Wow. Uh, commissions. Right. That's the, that's the better word. Right, right. Uh, it's amazing. So we were so happy. He was working so hard on this mm -hmm. and really making some headway. And uh, so that was something to be around heavy stuff like that. Absolutely. Like, wow. Damn, Absolutely. Right. Yes. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's like a feather in the cap for sure, man. Yeah. So that was 1987. So, but yeah, and I, I, at the Abersol camp, David taught there for all those years too. He just passed away a couple right. years ago. Yeah. So we'd see David every year and a bunch of my Indiana University friends right. out at the camp. So it was always a big reunion. Absolutely. And Jamie had gone to IU as well and studied with David before. Really? Yeah, before, uh, before you know, there was even really a jazz studies major. Right at the university. So yeah, I uh, Jamie, Jamie loves David, loved David and was always so admired David. You know? That's awesome, man. Yeah, I didn't know he was a trombone player. Yeah, I know. Well, I know he played trombone in college because I think he went to IU too, right? He did. Yeah, yeah. I didn't know that. Oh, David yeah. was a monster. <sighs> David played bass trombone and mm -hmm. played with. Um, uh, uh, oh my gosh! I didn't expect to be talking about this. It's all good, man. Don't worry about it. A whole it. bunch of iconic recordings mm -hmm. with, um, I'll think of it in a minute. This is old man stuff here. Anyway, he, he, he 1960, he was in yeah. Downbeat Magazine, the talent deserving wider recognition. He was first place. Wow. You know, Did not know that. Yeah, so he was in a car accident mm -hmm. a few years later and busted his face. Mm -hmm. And the story was that he was in Indiana and they wouldn't take him at the White Hospital, so they had to mm -hmm. delay getting right. to the hospital that would take him. And um, so it messed up his chops, and he was right. he was an incessant speaking and practicing all day, eight hour, ten hour a day. Practice. Right. And he wasn't supposed to practice for a long time. Right. He really got messed up. And David always took the high road and said it was a uh, uh, blessing because the guy didn't want to teach him. Mm. You know, he was an unbelievable teacher. Right. I'm gonna have to look that up. That's really embarrassing. That's all. I'll look it up too, man. We can collab on that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But a bunch of iconic recordings and him really just like wow. Damn. Yeah. Double tonguing. You know, yeah. Really fast technique and an amazing trombone player. He would have been one of those guys, sort of like almost like Clifford Brown, a sure. different style of playing where you wish they could have played throughout their whole adult career right. and seen where it had gone. Right. Um, you know, see what would have happened because he was still a young, young man, at right, thirty years old or whatever, twenty-five or thirty, and uh, wasn't able to play his trombone anymore. Too bad, man. Yeah, I'm gonna have to check him out. I actually never sought out any of his trombone playing. It might be something on YouTube, maybe some random recording or something like that. I, I'm sorry. You got to look at it now. Talking, I'm gonna work this up. Oh, okay, you, you got, got it. You got it. So, um, you go to IU. You're there, kind of doing your thing. Um, is that is is at that point? Did you kind of sort of decide then? What were, what what were you thinking as far as uh, uh, being a professional musician then? Because I know even now I talk to a lot of. Uh, you know, college age students and things like that, and they um, um, they don't really know you know, like how they're going to like work that out. You know what I'm saying? They don't really know like what it means to be a professional musician. Was when was that kind of like? So you, you probably started getting more serious in, in college. You realized you were you were more serious then than you were in high school. You thought you were doing something in high school. You found it. George Russell. George, George Russell. George Russell. Yes. I'm so embarrassed. I could. It's all good, man. A few years ago, I realized I didn't have 
and he kind of organized yeah. David's trombone recording. So mm -hmm. I ended up like buying all of the George Russell records he's on, you know, on eBay or whatever. Yeah. And so I got him organized on here, and I spent that whole summer listening to all that stuff, and it's unbelievable. Trombone yeah. Line. But it's George Russell. All right, guys. George Russell. If you want to hear, uh, uh, check out David Baker's plan. David Baker's plan. Aesthetic in particular, but yeah. all, all those are great. Well, you go to Indiana, mm -hmm. and like it's serious. Yeah, you know, it's high level stuff. All these incredible teachers. You know, Joseph Gingo's teaching violin. Mm -hmm. Yano Starker's teaching cello, and you've got world class teachers, and you've got heavy students who right. win competitions, win orchestra jobs, and they're they're very talented, super high intellect, and very very motivated. Wow. Yes. I remember one time I was getting a ride to a gig at like 7 a.m. on a Saturday morning. Wow, you know, yeah. And I went into school to get my horn. Mm -hmm. and there were people practicing. Woo! Uh, that a lot of fire out of you, man. Uh, yeah. Really? <laughs> yeah. Really? Yeah. Like my locker was by some practice room, so I went to get my horn yeah. to get a ride to this gig we had somewhere. And there were people practicing mm -hmm. at 7 in the morning on a Saturday morning. I was like, oh, wow. I yeah. Better, I better up my game. But anyway, Absolutely. but the whole school was like that. Yeah, and of course, I was so dreamy. I didn't know anything about anything. Mm -hmm. Were you there with Perez? Uh -huh. Were you really? Because I know he went there as well, man. He's obviously much older than I am. So Is he? <laughs> he I'm going to make sure he knows that. Yeah. He, was, he was in grad school when I was a freshman. Oh, so okay. Yeah. Okay. So he was doing his master's. And I was sure. Grad. But yeah, I've known Perez you know, since 83. Yeah. Great. Oh, man, I didn't know he was that old. And <laughs> Yes, I'm sorry, Perez. I love you, bro. I love you. I didn't, I didn't realize that. I thought it was, as you were talking. I'm like, oh, wait a minute. Perez went there. I wonder if you overlapped with him yeah, at and all. Yeah, Perez, man. you know, his uncle is Sly Hampton. Absolutely, it is. So Absolutely. One of my highlights at IU was playing in New York mm -hmm. at Symphony Space with Sly and Fred nice. in the band, and I was in David's band. That was my junior year. Nice, man. And, uh, boy, it was great. Sly was un unbelievable. He still sounds great He's now. killing now, yeah, yeah absolutely. But think about him in 1985. Is it 40 years ago almost? 35 I mean, years or something like just, that? Yeah. You know, you're job on the floor. Mm -hmm. And you're, you're still long, young and learning how to play. Right. Trying to develop a, a concept and a style of how to play. And David Baker and Sly were close friends, so Sly came in right. a few times to play. Absolutely. The clinic. So my freshman year, Sly's there. I, I didn't really know who he was. Right. And he's doing a, a master class with, like, Bob Hurst, who was a student, the bass player. Mm -hmm. And Jim Beard and Sean Pelton, some of our iconic IU jazz department names, I couldn't believe what I was hearing. Right. Like, oh my God, I want to sound like that. Right, I right. Never, never hit that level. Yeah, I understand. As a player, and I never mm -hmm. will, but, you know, that was my first time hearing Slide, and I've been in awe of him. Not only his playing, but his writing as well. Yeah, I, I, I came into the knowledge of his uh, compositions not that long ago, maybe like six years or so, uh, ago or so, but man, he's an incredible, incredible uh, uh, orchestrator and yes. just arranger, man. Yes. I, I don't know what it is about, you know, I'm not saying this because I'm a bone player and because you're a bone player. I feel like most of the time, the better players that, the better bone players that become writers kind of become the best, at, well, at least jazz writers anyway, yeah, man. a whole bunch of them. Yeah, uh, yeah. I think it's true. Yeah. My, my theory is that, you know, we're sitting in the middle of a band, mm -hmm. so you're hearing everything that's going on. Absolutely. I think that's a big part of it. It, ha it has to be. And it has to be on some level that we're frustrated but never really get the melody. So, <laughs> you know, no, no gigs, you know, right. You just have to do some writing. Right, man. Absolutely. But that's very true. There are a whole lot yeah. of long list of great trombone players who ended up becoming great orchestrators. If I'm not mistaken, players. Sammy Nesco was a bone player. Yeah. And he's, still, and he's still doing it. He's in his 90s. Yeah, man. Yeah, he's great. Yeah, he is. He is. Shout out to the bone players out here, man. <laughs> really making, <laughs> really making strides and uh, uh, doing great things for the, for, for the bone community. But Perez was great, and I've known him a long time, and he's always been very positive. I love that guy, real, man. Real force of nature. At one thousand percent. I, um, he was one of my uh, jazz instructors. I went to Chicago State before I went to the military, oh. and I was there for about a year, man. He was just, he's just real. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I and I love. I, I I needed that because I didn't really know what it meant. To really put the work in, right. you know what I'm saying. Right. Yeah. Perez has played with everybody, I mean, mm -hmm. through him being associated with his uncle and, and his whole family, really his whole family yeah. organization. Right. You know, right. he's he's seen what the, what what level you know yeah. it needs to be at. So, yeah, yeah man, big shout out Perez, love you, man. <laughs> I've been trying to get him on here, but he's just so damn busy, you know. Whatever. 
Maybe you can put a good word for me. <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, we're going to take a quick break, and then we're going to get into uh, when you actually decide to become a jazz musician. All right? Okay. All right, great. All right, guys, we're back here at the Arson Podcast. I have my new best friend, Timothy Coughlin, here. We're talking about trombone, and we were talking some shit about some stuff that we didn't record, but it's okay. It's <laughs> so you're in college. You're there with all these incredible players. Uh, do you remember the moment where you were like, okay, this is what I'm going to be doing? I mean, ideally, it would have been when you got to college, and you were like, oh, be the best trombone player you could be, but that... that can kind of be like a very nebulous thing. Yeah. What do you remember, kind of when it happened for you? Yeah, I think so. Um, I mean, I went to school with a real open mind, and of course, like I said, just so green, didn't mm-hmm. know anything about anything. Right? How do you make a living at this? What, Absolutely. What does it mean to be a professional musician, no matter what your instrument. But my freshman year, I was fortunate to make the second jazz band, which was a pretty big deal. And um, there were so many of these incredible classical trombonists that I, you know, they've always had three full-time mm-hmm. trombone. Wow, that's a lot. They all have you know, 15 students each. They have 45, 50 trombone players. Right. And many of them, this was a point where it was, it's a school where guys might win a job when they're a junior. Mm. And they do the job for a few years and they come back and finish their degree. Or they wow. come back and finish their master's because they were in the middle of a master's. Right. So there was, this was a point where there were all these like 25-year-old guys who had, been, who had had jobs around the world and they were coming back to finish their right. or master's only there another year or a half a year. Right. And you'd go to master class and hear them play, and it's like, wow, mm-hmm. these guys are unbelievable. And I mean, they're out there. they had already won jobs. Right. So that, that didn't really deter me so much, but I was having more success playing jazz and realizing this is what I enjoy right. playing, playing more than that. And I, after our first concert, this uh, one of the trombone majors came up to me and said, are you a freshman? Mm-hmm. Yeah. What is your major? I said, well, I'm not really sure. You should be a jazz major. That'd be good. Mm. <laughs> okay. Really? Like, okay. <laughs> yeah. 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 You should be a jazz major. It'll right. Be, it'll be. It'll be fine. It'll mm-hmm. work out fine. It was. It, it was. You know, a nice vote of confidence or whatever. Right. It was kind of. Funny. He said it in a funny way. Right. 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 Like you have a much better chance of being a jazz major than a classical major. Understood. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. But, you know, I was heading in that direction anyway. Mm-hmm. I was already taking like the improvisation class from David. And, right. And, and, and signed up for some of those classes anyway, and enjoyed them. You know, they were they were not easy, but I enjoyed them a whole lot. But I'd say freshman year. Then you heard slide play my freshman year when he came in and my jaw went off the floor. Whoa. And I, you know, yeah. So I would say early on I started gravitating toward that. Mm-hmm. But I still played classical trombone and played a few gigs during the year because it's, it's good for your overall trombone. Absolutely. Trombone. Absolutely. I, you know, every, every, every trombone teacher I've ever had, uh, they definitely emphasize uh, both, right. both as uh, Audrey was my teacher here, yeah. you know, and she was my teacher. Really? We moved, Man, I told you we moved. Big shout, Audrey. Yeah. yeah. She's, a yeah. Great, she's a great teacher. We moved from Baltimore to Oak Park, and I went to mm-hmm. Oak Park High School, middle of my sophomore year, and right. I asked Dr. Ron Holloman, my old band director, yeah. for a reference, referral for a trombone teacher, and she was teaching right nearby at Concordia College in great. the Forest. And I called her up, and I had two and a half years of lessons from Audrey. <sighs> so then when we played in the Chicago Jazz Ensemble, it yeah. was good. Great. How cool is that? Teacher man. student uh, relationship. Right. She's a fantastic teacher. She is, man. She great, has great, a uh, great musician, great teacher. She has a wealth of knowledge as far as like just techniques for how to overcome the little trombone hurdles, sure. you know. And uh, I, I was doing bass trombone, and I was playing lead. You know, I was doing both. You wow. know, because wow. I just that's hard. Yeah. Well, you know, I uh, what I didn't like switching trombones, like regardless, because I just. I didn't have the chops for it. I kind of got, I kind of got big lips, sort of. You know what I mean? And I was like, man, switching to a smaller mouthpiece wasn't really working for me. Yeah. Black, whatever. whatever. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but it, it was, it just wasn't working for me, you know. And I didn't like. And I'm sure you've dealt with it. Uh, when, when you're, when you're switching between the two, the your armature is just different enough, and it sits in the cup just different enough. To where, if for nothing else, I think we overestimate how we hear the sound. It probably sounds just fine. Right. But the amount of discomfort you feel is just enough to, like, 
push you over this. Like, I'm sick of this. You know what I mean? I, I like, could, I couldn't agree more. Yeah, how, yeah. How this feels is often has no bearing on how it actually sounds up front. Right. But it feels bad, so you think you sound bad. But exactly. It's, you know, now you sound fine. Yeah, yeah. But I couldn't deal with that, so I was like, all right, you know what? I'm just gonna have to make sure I sound good on this one trombone, doing everything, and I just. I just refused to switch, and because I was playing on a, a, a F attachment, people always just so, oh, you play you play baseball, and I'm like, you got a gig? Well, then yes, <laughs> yes. well then yes. yes, you know what I mean. But then I'd be in big band playing lead or something like that, right. or doing you know, I was on a salsa band, and I was playing on a, a big bone too, you know what I mean? And it's all it it is hard work, yeah. and it's all fast and it's all high, yeah. you know what I mean? I mean, basically, when you're switching mouthpieces, you have to practice doing it. You do. I've done a little bit of Broadway playing, here, mm -hmm. and sometimes you have two trombones. I, I subbed on Legally Blonde for a nice. great trombone player here in town last year, mm -hmm. and I had three trombones. Wow. Really ridiculous. Yeah. You know, the orchestration is cut down, so instead of having 35 people right. like you should, or 30, mm -hmm. you've got 15, or exactly. 13, so then you're playing like, you know, third clarinet parts, and fourth trumpet parts, and a French right. part, and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So the, that gig had, you know, jazz lead, like a traditional jazz trombone, mm -hmm. an F attachment, and a bass trombone. Right. So I'm running in to sub with three trombones. Right. And he left all the mutes for me to use, so this big area of mutes. But you, but you have to sit home and practice you and get your chops ready. Because sometimes you're playing some real quick thing on bass trombone. <laughs> but then yeah. you've got to hit a Absolutely. Ba -ba -da -da. Yeah. I see on your little jazz trombone mm -hmm. within eight measures. And that, that's all part of practicing not only the logistics of where each trombone stand is going to be, right. but the amateur part of getting your chops used to playing, in that case, three different mouthpieces. Absolutely. And ha having them switch pretty quickly within mm -hmm. a few seconds. Absolutely. And hopefully sounding okay. Pit life, everybody. Oh. If you don't know about it. <laughs> and, and, and subbing is even rough, rougher than it is. doing it, just being at the beginning of the rehearsals because you're you do, man. You know, when you, when, because there's just a level of familiarity once you've done the gig 25 times. Right. You know what I mean? But you're already nervous because you want to sound good. You know what I mean? And that, I mean, you've been around for a while, but there's a chance you don't know anybody on the gig. So if you come in, you make a few mistakes. Everybody's looking at me, this guy sucks. Yeah, this, yeah, is, yeah, right. Right. <laughs> this is the guy you brought in, you know. So, no, I, I get it. Yeah. I get it. And the main thing is all stopping and starting. So you can exactly. easily have a solo, uh, unintended solo. Right. If you start right. in a hole. And there's always a thousand cuts, man. Cut cuts and, and you know lots I mean? of vamps. And the vamps right. are based on what's going on on stage. So Absolutely. So this little section might be different each night based on the you know what's happening on stage. One hundred percent. You gotta stop or the sound effect happening mm -hmm. because it's matching something on stage. Very challenging. It is, it is. Right. 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 Playing is, is very hard. It is, it is, it is you know what, it'll keep you on your toes. Um, as far as, well, at least initially until you get used to it, you know, then you can sleepwalk through the gig. But, uh, you get, like you say, you gotta be ready. You gotta be able to play a bunch of different styles, man. Sure. That's when, you know, having the good classical chops really matter. Of course. Having a good jazz chops really matter. And if you can, mm -hmm. you know, if you're a low brass player, maybe if you can mess around on tuba a little bit, you know, maybe you, I haven't been in too many orchestras where tuba was required, but if you could do it, you know, it keeps you in the front of somebody's mind. It's like, oh man, he can play some tuba, well, you know. Andy Baker, again, maybe the top called trombone player on Broadway, mm -hmm. he plays tuba. Oh, does Every he really? Every time he got one, he was sending me pictures of him playing the tuba. Yeah. It was hilarious, but, mm -hmm. you know, that's what it is. Like Absolutely. Times, it's a bass trombone, tuba, double. Right. Or tenor trombone, you know, bass trombone, tuba, and even euphonium. Some of those guys play euphonium. Absolutely. You know. Absolutely. Well, oh yeah, oh yeah, for sure, man. You can't sound like it's your second instrument. You got to sound like you can play it. One hundred percent. Because there's definitely somebody out there that makes it sound like they play play piano. Right. So yeah, I I uh, I was kind of hesitant to it, but my high school teacher got me doing euphonium, and then because it just felt right to do, I also picked up tuba. Sure. I don't play either one of them nearly as much now. I probably that's a mistake on my part. <laughs> but uh, I, I I I should definitely be getting those chops back up. So woodwind players are the only ones who. Should be able to double, you know. That's something that we should be able to do for sure, man. Right, right. Yeah, I like I like theater gigs, man. It's just you know, after after a while, after a few weeks, man, I'm just like All you have right. to have a certain personality and mindset to be able to do it. Absolutely, especially if you have a long running decision. Absolutely, absolutely, definitely bring books, little snacks or something yeah, like that. I, yeah, I, I saw Hamilton, and that thing's running for several years. Absolutely, you know, that's not easy. 
Mm -hmm. I saw I saw a weekly when it was running years ago, and that ran. I think the first one was four years. Sounds about right. Can you imagine playing wicket for four years? No, oh, that would be pretty tough. Yeah, I think. But the, the checks at, at that level are pretty good, right? right? That downtown money, we call it. Yes, it's mm -hmm. good, good go. Okay. <laughs> maybe I need to maybe I need to reevaluate myself. So, um, uh, when I was thumbing through your, uh, your 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 bio, you played with some really big names. Mm -hmm. When did those breaks start to happen for you? You know, was that like uh, how 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 far into your trombone career? And like, who who put you on? You know, did somebody just know you and thought, oh man, this a there's this young guy who can who can play pretty well. You know, was it a subbing situation? How did that work out? Yeah, let's see. Well, I was fortunate at IU in Bloomington, Indiana. It's an hour from Indianapolis, mm -hmm. which has a, you know, a nice little music scene. Right. Not the depth of Chicago. Right. The top guys, most of them went to IU, mm -hmm. maybe many years before I did, and they were really good. And it seemed like, you know, if you had two big bands worth of gigs going on in one night, they didn't have right. enough people to cover. Right. And you might get a recommendation from somebody. So I was lucky. Uh, getting a few gigs that way, joining the union, mm -hmm. um, the local three, Indianapolis local, uh, mm -hmm. 1984, 85, right. whatever year I joined. And um, and I got to, I traveled with Amy Williams, uh, it had a Christmas show every year, I did that, ended up doing that a bunch of years in a row. Right. So that was like 20 years old, mm -hmm. and I thought I'd die and gone to heaven. Right, and right. I was like, oh, I'm getting paid money and I'm playing, and these guys are all band ladies in the band, everybody sounds great. Absolutely. An incredible experience. And then, of course, my he's my parents. You know, Birds worry about yeah, me. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Maybe Tim's going to be able to. Right, 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 right. <laughs> so, and then I moved to town, and uh, most recommendations are from other trombone players. Absolutely. And I was fortunate to be here in the '90s. I call it the Roaring '90s mm -hmm. because the economy was killing. Right. And uh, there, there was so many gigs. I think even then, you're talking guys who were older than, than I, I was in in the '80s and '70s. There'd be more, more work going on, but in the 90s, there was still a lot of work going wow. on. Wow. Uh, tons of weddings, tons of parties, tons of, they hire a band for everything. Right. All right. Christmas office parties, you mm -hmm. have like a new, you know, Christmas party on a Friday for the Christmas party. Yeah. For, for, the, for, the, for the law firm. Right, you know? right. So, um, yeah, there was a lot of activity, a lot of stuff going on in Chicago. So, and I was out making the scene and mm -hmm. playing in all these big bands, meeting other trombone players and other people. Mm -hmm. Sure. What 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 would you con consider to be like the highlight? I know I know you've had a, quite a few. Um, we were talking earlier off camera about you playing with the Chicago Jazz Ensemble, which was led by John Faddis. Uh, I think after uh, Mr. Bruce, Bill yeah, Bruce after after Bill Russo passed away, then John Faddis was directing. Yeah. Right. Um, you know, maybe maybe that's it. What 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 would you say? Maybe not one. What are like your top three? Like man, this was, uh, you know. <laughs> I, I, I wish I had a picture. I want to show my grandkids this kind of thing. Well, one of my very best career highlights was auditioning and playing with the WDR band in Cologne, Germany. Oh, nice, years. man. That was in 2009. They had a second trombone opening, and I've got a friend who plays bass in the band, mm -hmm. so they brought in 15 or 20 wow. people mm -hmm. a week or two at a time to play a project and see if you got along with trombone players. Mm -hmm. you know, it wasn't just like you came in and played an audition and split. Right. You stayed there got put up in a nice hotel, mm -hmm. and Cologne's got this incredible cathedral, so I stayed right around the corner from the cathedral, and the, the WDR studios are right right around that corner, so it was a great experience. I played a, the show was with Arturo Sandoval, <sighs> called Mambo, on, Mambo Nights. Yeah. I mean, it was a joke. Yeah. Can you even yeah. pay money for this? Right, this right, 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 right. This is a word. Yeah. So I flew in on a Sunday night, had Monday off to get acclimated to right. time change. Rehearsals were Tuesday to Friday, like, and to two. Okay. Evening off, weekend off. And I'm emailing my friend John mm -hmm. Goldsby, the bass player in the band. Is this right? You have a weekend off? He goes, yeah, yeah. man, this is a day job. Yeah, that's awesome, man. I'm kidding. And then uh, Arturo came in on Monday, and we rehearsed like doubles with him, 10 to 2, right. 3 to 6 or something. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, rehearsed his music. And um, Thursday, played at the Philharmonic, the big theater, the free lunch hour thing. Absolutely. A live concert on the radio. And then promoting the concert that night, and played with them on thir that Thursday night, and then flew back home the next morning. Mm -hmm. Marshall Jokes, an amazing trombone player. Oh yeah, yeah. He, he won. He actually won the job, and he he had it about three years, and then he 
put it, uh, other people have replaced it. So I mean, it was really an incredible experience. It's a radio orchestra funded, yeah. funded by the government, and um, it was like auditioning for the New York Philharmonic. Absolutely. Except, except it was a big band. I didn't know that was his gig. He did it for three or four years. You know why he stepped down? I think he wanted to be in the U.S. and just be playing oh. here. I mean, he's really one of the international star, one of the greatest in the world. Yeah, he's incredible. Yeah, amazing. Yeah. So I, I think I played the week after he did. Oh, okay. It's not like a third grader. Yeah, like, yeah. Like, 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 <laughs> I'm like, wait, Marshall was just here? Yeah. Like, yeah, he played the last thing. Like, oh, oh, my God. Well, damn. Okay, well. I guess I'll just enjoy this while it lasts. Right, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, guys. <laughs> but there were, like I said, guys from all over the world, you know, yeah. coming in for a week or two, depending on what the project was. For sure. So that was that was one of them, for sure. I played a few things in Millennium Park that were really amazing where you're out there, jazz festival. And the weather's perfect, and the place is just packed. Absolutely. And if, you, if you've ever been on stage, I have. Park, it's and you look out, and the place is full. It's like, mm -hmm. wow, this is really, really amazing. Yeah, I saw you last year with uh, with John. It looked like a lot of guys from the uh, yeah. Chicago Jazz Ensemble. It was a big reunion. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah. Uh, who was playing Lee Sex? What's the name of the black guy? It was two years ago. Was that two years ago? Antonio, Antonio Hart. Antonio Hart, Antonio Hart that's his name. Yeah, yeah thank you, thank so, you. Yeah, he's number Yeah, he's stupid good. He's stupid. The first time I heard him was uh, on that Things to Come. I was a, it was a Dizzy uh, a reunion band. He mm -hmm. was on that. And I was like, man, who is Antonio Hart, yeah, man? He was killing. He Whew. was really playing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, love him, man. Love him. So we got the WDR band, Millennium Park gig. You were with the Sinatra band at one point. You subbed for them? Did that? I did a few Frank's, Frank gigs with, with Frank, with Senior. When okay. When I was a young kid, I probably couldn't, you know, didn't really appreciate yeah, what, yeah. what was happening here, who, who I was playing with. Mm -hmm. And then later, Frank Sinatra Jr., his son, right. who sounds just like his dad. Yeah. And it was all those like, same iconic arrangements. Right. You look at the part and it says, Sinatra bass. Mm, like, right. Whoa. Oh, man, this is like Jazz Hall of Fame. Yeah, yeah, this is like the stuff. Yeah. yeah just, just a few years ago, Frank Jr. passed away, and he was having, uh, he had a lot of gigs because it was the 100th anniversary of his father's mm -hmm. birth. So that. So they had made several gigs around here, and I was playing in the band. Nice. So it would have been really, of course, having a great time. Of course, playing man. that kind of iconic music. But yeah, I, I toured with the same contractor with Andy Williams. Do you know who Andy Williams is? I don't. Yeah, uh, it's the most wonderful time of the year, the Christmas thing. Right. You know those kind of stuff. He, Andy was a huge TV star, and he had a whole bunch of hits. Oh, uh, so uh, right, I gotta study him. Yeah. Yeah. So that's yes. I, I say this stuff to people your age, and they're like, "I'm sorry, I have no idea." Yeah, I don't know Andy Williams. Is. I'm sorry. But then later I did a some yeah. touring with Pia, Pia Zadora, another mm -hmm. singer, yeah, yeah, same yeah. contractor, and she had some of Sinatra's people in the band. Her husband nice. was a billionaire, so he was bangling her. Oh, really? <laughs> nice. <laughs> when, when we played in Las Vegas, he, right. owned, he owned the uh, Riviera Hotel, so we played there a bunch of times. And one New Year's Eve gig we played, they had two orchestras hired, so on one floor was Sinatra and the other floor was Pia, and then they rotated. So like part of my wow. New Year's Eve gig, with Frank Sinatra yeah. the Riviera. Dude, how cool is that? It was man. nuts, and I was 25 years old or whatever, and, and still probably not realizing the, like what a big deal this is. Absolutely. Like, just trying to play and sound good. And, Absolutely. You know, hopefully I don't make a fool of myself. And right. Play, and these great professional players, but I'm like, I'm playing with Frank Sinatra. It was, wow. Absolutely, man. So, so I, okay, so first off, I don't know how it was back then, but the few casino games I've done now, they really pay. Was it was it was it like that when you were playing? Well, it was Sinatra, so I mean, but it, it paid all right. I mean, that was part of why they hired a band from in, Indiana instead of like a New York or LA band or a Chicago band. Oh, so you could chip me. Well, you know, I, was yeah. <laughs> when I was a young kid. And I was just glad to have the gig. Yeah, of course, of course. But, but, that, but that gig, they actually had brought in a couple guys from Los Angeles. Mm, so Charlie, okay. Charlie Wilbur was playing trombone, and he's been on Michael Jackson records, and right? Movie days, and people right? Like, I was like, wow, Charlie Wilbur. Like, yeah, he was super nice, and he played. Of course it did, yeah. So, I got, okay, I got a question. Um, and this is for all the young trombone players out there. You, one thing really stood out to me is, as a guy who's done a decent amount of auditions myself. Uh, how do you, especially if you don't really get like a solo part, and maybe you do, you know, maybe you get a chorus or two. Mm -hmm. How do you stand out when there's 30 guys and they're all A-plus players, right? And really, at that point, you're kind of deciding, you know, tomato, tomato, you know, you know, like sugar in your grits or salt, you know, whatever. 
how do you stand out or really make um, make a name for yourself when the guys you're playing with are all killing, and the guys that were that came before the audition are, are, are killing, and the guys that are coming out after you are killing? You know, I mean, obviously you got to go out there and you got to do what you do, but what are some of the tricks that people can do to kind of you know make themselves stand out from the crowd in a, in a situation like that? <laughs> Sorry, I had to ask. No, you mean yeah. like, like a big band audition? Or yeah, a big band audition. You might get in with a with a. You may get in a situation. So I've done like a background for singers. You know what I mean. Okay. So it might be one trombone player and sure. you know maybe two other horn players or maybe three other horn players. You know, uh, or you are doing a big band thing, or it may be an orchestral thing, and it's a you know uh, like you said, it's a second trombone spot. You know, right. other than obviously you want to know all the music, right? And you want to be as close to whatever recording that you kind of latch on to. They're all slightly different, but maybe you just want to latch on to one, you know. Sure. Uh, how do you stand out, you know what I'm saying? That's a great question. Um, yeah, I mean, preparation helps. Being nice, easy to work with. Right. Can help. That's part of why they brought you over. Right. In that situation. I mean, I don't really do, like, auditions so mm -hmm. much, you know. Usually you just get hired for a gig. You may be auditioning for something you don't realize you're auditioning for something, and then you may not get called back. Right. If they, you know, didn't care about how you played, but it wasn't necessarily an audition mm -hmm. uh, if you don't play that well. Or maybe if you just sub for somebody on a gig and you know, somebody else has the thing. But, you know, just all the things that make you successful in any other walk of life. Being nice, easy to work with, right. dressing presentably, mm -hmm. uh, don't show up one minute for the downbeat. Right. The band leader doesn't need a stupid trombone player to be there causing you a headache. Absolutely. Because you're the lowest priority on the band left. Oh, for sure. You know, so like, I'm going to get this gig a half hour early set up. Mm -hmm. I've been warming up at home, so I, I should be okay. I shouldn't mm -hmm. sound bad in the first tune. Right, right, you know, right. That kind of stuff. And if you're playing a big band gig and you have a solo, you know, it's not the same as playing a small group gig with a solo where you have, like, many choruses and a chance right. to develop a solo. Mm -hmm. So probably, if you're playing some tune, take the A train, 32 bar form, yeah. you might have two choruses, and the second chorus is backgrounds. Mm -hmm. So you better mm -hmm. start kind of heated up. And right, more upper register of the horn, mm -hmm. cut through things, you know, to be heard. You can't be like ironic and sublime and all this kind of stuff. Right, and you got to you know bring some heat, mm -hmm. probably quicker than maybe you want to. Right, right, right. The tune. You have to just sort of feel it out and see what the what the context of the situation. Is. For sure. You know, Dr. Lark at Paul, one of my colleagues, had the line he says that the students all make fun of him, but context determines everything, and it really is true. So you have to sort of figure out what what it is. You know, when you think about it trombone player, one of the most famous in the world, like Trombone Shorty. Right. You know, it's a different thing. Absolutely it is. But he's great. Yeah. Amazing. So if you're playing a gig like that, you got to play it like that. Yeah. If you're playing a more, you know, swing era kind of big band, mm -hmm. then you got to play it differently. You don't play like Trombone Shorty. Right, 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 right. So. Yeah, yeah I, I, I... Did that sort of answer your question? Yeah, it, 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 it did, man. Well, you definitely touched on some things, you know. And like I said, I know most of that, but it's, you know, some people... Like I said, I said audition, but... If it's not your gig, it's always kind of an audition because, sure. you know, you play with a guy and, you know, uh, they need a sub or they, they need an extra guy. You know, a lot of times, most of the gig, like, like you said, almost every gig I've gotten has been from, a, from another trombone Absolutely. player, you know, or at the very least from another horn player. Yeah. You know, I, I'm not at the point now where I really know, like, booking agents, you know, stuff like that. Right. But, you know, I know a lot of guys... And they're like, oh yeah, I played with him. He was he was cool. He showed showed up early. Sure. He knew the music. You know, uh, I just did a gig a few weeks ago where the guy called me the day before for a gig, and he sent me sixteen songs. Oh wow! I didn't know all sixteen songs, but my ear was developed enough. Sure. I had it was it was uh, like a Latin fusion band. I had played in a salsa band before, so I had some experience to lean on. You know what I mean? Sure. And uh, you know, I did my best to be just attentive. So when I listened to the trump the trumpet player do a thing. And I'm like, oh, okay, I'll do it. I'll do exactly how he just did it. And I'll do something slick, like I'll play it up a third, or on the, you know, the held note, I play like a color tone, like a flat nine or something like that. You know what I mean? Yeah. And something like that sticks out. You know, it's like, oh, you know, one, you're following. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Try, uh, trying to fit in. Absolutely. You know what I mean? You kind of make it fun. You know, maybe they laugh and you laugh. It's like, ha ah, yeah. You know, that, that, that kind of thing. That, 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 go, that all goes along, you know. But the getting along portion of things, you know. It's very important. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Back to the hypersensitive nature of musicians. 
Absolutely. People can take stuff the wrong way. For yeah. sure. Whatever. Or For sure. You look at them funny if the chord's out of tune. Yeah, it's like, come on, guy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> exactly. You know, you kind of vibe exactly. It. And the other thing, you probably didn't try to steal the gig from your friends. What? what no. That, uh, I just wanted to fit right on I, in I've whatever seen, it was. I've man. seen that happen where people try to. So, what's happening? You got some more gigs, man? What's yeah. It? Playing the, you know who's playing the band like that's really not cool. So right, don't right. Try to steal, don't try to make it obvious you're trying to steal the gig from. Absolutely, man. You're subbing for. Yeah, and you know I uh, I didn't take any long solos. You know I just did the thing. You know I I, I kind of have a thing where like unless you have like a whole like bag of tricks, I, I kind of feel like it's best to maybe take two chords and just yeah. stop playing. Always leave them wanting more. Absolutely, sure. absolutely. <laughs> that's what I did, and that's what I did. Like I said, I only had really one night to learn all the music, so yeah. I just kind of was like, "All right, I'll, 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 I'll do the thing. I'll do like the high trombone thing, you know, right. you know, and I'll, I'll just step away. It's like, okay, now you got it. You know what I'm saying? Kind so, of, yeah, yeah. Kind little of, trick of the trade for you. Get through the game. At one thousand percent, one thousand percent, man. <laughs> yeah. So let's take one more break, and then we'll. Uh, I got a question about the union, man. I, I okay. kind of, uh, I know you said you were in one. I don't know if you're in one. Now, um, we talk about social media a little bit, and I don't know the role of the union now, because I think things have just changed a lot. Sure. Maybe you can help me out with that. I can try. All right, we can try. All right, cool. We'll be right back, guys. <laughs> All right, guys, we're back for our last little segment here with uh, Timothy Coughlin, and I left off... Uh, Wanting to talk about the uh, the musicians union, mm -hmm. and you said you were in it in Indiana. Are you still in it now? Of course. Okay. So, what is the role of the musicians union uh, as it stands right now, without shitting on the union? Because <laughs> <laughs> I am not, and a lot of younger musicians I know are not as well. So I know there's a disconnect there, so maybe you can oh, help course. bridge that. Well, I wish I had Leo Murphy or, or BJ Levy or somebody here for okay. to give you a better answer than I'll probably Maybe you can put me in touch with them. Sure. Yeah, I'd be great. Thank you. All right. Well, I mean, tell us I about think, it. you know, the basic role of the union is to make the working conditions and pay better for all the musicians. Right. And I think we all have benefited, even if we don't realize we've benefited, where, like, weddings pay more money because mm -hmm. of our everyone's role in the union. Right. The people who have been in the union, where the pay goes higher and we all stick together. Right. Band leaders know they're not going to get a good band unless they pay mm -hmm. X amount of money and have breaks and treat people nicely with respect. And Absolutely. All that kind of stuff. I mean, the reality is probably now that most the main people benefiting from being in the union are the Chicago Symphony people, the Lyric Opera people, and the Broadway people. Mm -hmm. And the enrollment in the, the membership is, is probably lowest than it's ever been. Right. You know, because less and less people really feel like they're getting anything from the union or any kind of real union work. Right. And then there's some pension problems with that too, because less people are in the union, so there's less union work, and then less money is going into the union pension, so then they're you know, having some problems. I didn't know there was a pension. Yeah, so if, like if you That's play a big deal, if man. you That's play a Broadway show for six weeks, you know, right. part, part of your pay is going to go to the, uh, into the pension, or even if you just do a you know a broad a, a gig like a union gig for a day, a Rita Franklin or something. Right. You know, you pay a rehearsal, the show, you get paid your money, and then part of your bread theoretically is going to go into your pension. Mm -hmm. Wow. So, but the role has always been to, you know, make better working conditions, have a standardized pay for people mm -hmm. and that kind of thing. So mm -hmm. I was actually just thinking about having somebody from the union come in and talk to the DePaul students this year about the benefits of being in the union and actually right. trying to keep it going. Right. You know, because if some of these guys are 80, 60 and 70 years old, they're trying to get their pension and hopefully it's all going to still going to be there. Right. But every, everything has changed. There's less work, less adult pain. <laughs> no, that's real. You yeah, know what I mean, you have the, yeah, it's a good point. The, the gig economy, that side, get your side hustle on that Uber commercial. I thought right. was clever and very apropos to what we all do because we're all running around doing a lot of different things. Absolutely. And nobody's full time in a school, mm -hmm. you know, so like we're all paying for our own benefits, and that, but you're running around working different things. Right. And some of that's kind of fun because there's a lot of variety, but it's, it's, it's difficult. It's a hustle. It's a lot of work. For sure. And having a long standing, like regular job that pays. Harder, getting harder and harder to find and get. Yeah. So, um, but the, if you call the union up, I'm sure they'd give you a better response than I just gave you. Sure. So talk to them. I've been having to do that. Yeah. Because, you know, as a young guy, I, you know, uh, I have never really even thought about 
joining the union. Mm -hmm. And I know that all the guys back in the day were all union guys, you know, like all of them, you know. And it was a big deal to be a part of the union. It was right. kind of like you weren't really, really getting the, the great gigs if you weren't, you know what I mean? Yeah. Well, that's part of it, too. Yeah. You have to be considered to play at Virginia or Chicago Theater or whatever. You generally have to be. Right. Or you get called to do like a you know, TV or radio commercial. Yeah. You know, you have to or play on somebody's album. Mm -hmm. You really need to be in the union. Okay. And, and your people respect you a little more. You're at a higher level of, mm -hmm. of gigs and of work. Right. You know, so if you're in the union, you know, it indicates a, a different thing. Mm. It's almost like, it sounds like having a college degree almost. But <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I get it. Well, you know, what's, what's, in, what's, what's interesting about it is, you know, I've done a lot of free gigs. I've done a lot of $50 gigs. I've done a lot of, you know, $100 gigs that were like three hours worth of work. Yeah, so yeah, like, I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 and I, you know, some of the guys, you know, a, at least amongst us young guys, and I, I sure. you know, what I'm saying, um, we we're, we're on the gigs with you. You know what I mean? Yeah. And you know, no disrespect to all the work that you've put in. You know, uh, just all all the great musicians and, and, and everywhere. It's not just Chicago thing. I've noticed it in New York. I've, noticed, I've heard about it in L.A. You know, it's probably it's probably true mostly everywhere. It's like, well, why would I join the union if we're doing the same gigs, you know? And I'm sure, and everything that you just said, I, I believe you, I trust that it's it, it's real, and it all makes sense to me. It's like, oh yeah, well, in, in this type of work, there isn't the steady nine to five thing, you know? It's nice to have some representation. It's nice to know, oh well, uh, uh, if, the, if I have questions, I can call somebody and ask that's been in the industry for 30, 40 years. And if years. you get stiffed on a gig, if you have a union contract, then mm -hmm. you have free legal representation. See, that, that's awesome. That's a big deal. That, that's fantastic. However, a lot of us aren't really getting gigs like that. Of course. You know, and it's it, the landscape, we kind of talked about this off, off camera too, the landscape has just changed, you know. Quite dramatically. Yeah. Even, even in my time as a musician. Yeah, well, yeah, you've probably really seen it coming up in the late 80s, you know, into the 90s where you probably were in that last rush of there's a lot of gigs, everybody can work, you know. And now, I, 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 in my time, I feel like if I'm not creating a gig, then it's not real work. And For sure. That's not a fair assessment, it, completely, you know what I mean? Yeah. Because I've done a lot of gigs, and I love, I, I love playing with my friends. Mm -hmm. Almost really more than I love money, and it, that has stiffed me, you know what I'm saying? I love, I also don't have a family, so sure. let, me, let, me, let, me, let me say that. Uh, I love playing with my friends, and I like getting, I love getting paid well to play with my friends. Of course. That doesn't happen a lot of times, you know what I mean? But I'm like, well, if I'm not creating the gig, and if I'm not making sure that things are going well, and I'm figuring out how the money is gonna work, then I'm never really gonna make good money. You know, and I, I see that same thing spilling over into, you know, regular working jobs where, you know, if people aren't starting their own businesses or at least have their own kind of side hustle, right. something like this, you know, which right. is not necessarily paying me right now, I just love to do it. Mm -hmm. um, then it's like, well, you know, I'm, what's, what's the point? What's the point of joining a union if we're on the same gigs? We're not. But we could be. I've played gigs with your contemporaries, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. If we're on the same gigs and, you know, the money is crap. So, you know, I, I, I don't know. It's, it's, that's that's kind of how a lot of us young people have kind of gotten into it. And I don't know what the union is doing now. I would love to ask them about, you know, the, the, the social media stuff. I would love to ask them about, you know, advertising in, today, in today's day and age and what they could do to maybe uh, sort of bridge that gap or maybe fill in those pieces of information that don't exist for somebody like me. Yeah, you're, you know? asking, you're asking great questions. They have people... Some of it, they have older people working over there. Mm -hmm. there's, there's younger people working there as well, trying to do, I think, what you were talking about. Yeah. About making the union uh, vital and important, and how can they really serve someone like you, your, your, sure. age, your age group? Right. You know, being in the union, you know, it's a couple hundred bucks a year. Are you mm -hmm. going to get a couple hundred bucks a year worth of union gigs? Right, so right. That, that's that's real. That's real. To pay for it. So um, those are all valid points. Right. And the real, the real truth is that only really, like, Few hundred people are really benefiting from being in the union right now. Right, right. You know, I mean, I have money in there from, from my pension mm -hmm. that'll be a little bit when I retire, but I have my own self-employed person right uh, pension that I'm more counting on than my. 
I, I understand. Black, I black understand. I understand. Just attention. For sure. So those are all great points, and uh, I wish I had a, a, a better prepared to answer your question. I Maybe mean, I should have emailed you. That. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know I was going to ask you that because you just brought it up. And I'm like, yeah, man, I actually don't know anything about it. Well, but I mean, if you're going to make a to play at you know, some of the higher profile venues, mm-hmm. you need to pay me. So maybe that's something I'll look at. If you yeah. play at Symphony Center or you play at Virginia or you play at the Chicago Theater or right. places like that, um, you, you need to be paid. Okay, great. Well, that's something to think about, guys. Um, so before I let you go, we, we talked a lot about the changing landscape. How would you now tell young musicians, well, what advice would you have for them as far as really kind of making a name for themselves? Uh, I mean, if, 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 you want to, if you want to talk about specifically the, the, the music stuff, that's fine. If you want to talk about the business end of it, that's fine. Uh, the personal aspect of it, you know, however you want to go about it. But, you know, as far as maybe like getting into the, maybe you even want to get into like the fact that you're an educator now as well, you know, as a, a part of your side hustle. Uh, or maybe you just tell me how, how, how you're figuring it out. However you want to go about it. That's a very broad question. But, you know, in today's day and age, how do we make it work? No, it's, it's, it's a great question, and it's not, there's no answer, one answer. Mm-hmm. You, know, you get 20 people like me in here to ask that question, you get 20 different answers. Absolutely. Which is part of the fun. Um, I think because there's less work, regular work, I think what you sort of said, people end up sort of making their own thing. Right. So creatively trying to make it happen, and then just financially. So for me, it seemed obvious just to try to start teaching. Mm-hmm. So I was very lucky to start uh, teaching at New Trier High School. I was a trombone teacher. Uh, schools got a lot of money and a huge right. support for their arts, fine arts. So I had two days of like, you know, epic long day of teaching for right. 12 months. But then people know that schools, and then they say, well, I'm teaching at New Trier. Oh, that's great. They probably are a pretty confident musician. And right. So my reputation started getting better as a teacher, and then I got hired at DePaul in 1997. Nice. And I was lucky to get hired there as well. So just teaching. Well, you were still pretty young getting, get, what were you, like 30 or something like that? Um, yeah, early 30s. So that's, that's awesome. Yeah, man. and you teach at DePaul, and you know that's there's some incredible faculty there. So it's absolutely been, it's been an incredible honor being there since '97, and um, it leads you to other clinics. You know, do a guest spot with a high school band, and, and, mm-hmm. you know, um, and then doing Jamie's camp right for 27 years now or whatever, 28 mm-hmm. years. Um, that stuff all helps too. So for me, teaching jazz education has been a big part of not right. not intended initially, but sure, but sure. You, you mentioned you get married and have some have a family. And you that was Things change. Steady <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, man. Um, but yeah, you're, I mean, not to sound corny, but your love of doing it will carry you through. So, right. So you have to have a really good work ethic and keep at it, keep at it, keep at it, keep mm-hmm. practicing, keep doing your thing. And you get students and you, you know, try to get your teaching thing better and better because initially, you know, I started teaching and I was like, oh my God, what am I doing? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. But you know, you ask, ask some of your other, I called up Audrey. Nice. Hello. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> what do I do? Calm down. Oh, I can just go to try this, try this, and you start, you start figuring it out. Right. Um, and the kids see that you're earnest with your intentions, and you mean well, and you're trying hard, and they'll, they'll respect that. Right. Even, even if they don't practice, they'll at least. Right. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice yeah. And you're they'll feel bad about the fact that they didn't practice. Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then I get recommended. You, so I, you know, met guys on these big band gigs. So then I really love playing in big bands mm-hmm. and try to get that going. Absolutely. And then you get recommended for. Wedding band, so it just all kind of builds on itself. But you just sort of have to make it happen yourself and figure out what. You, the main thing really is to figure out what you like to do and what you're good at. What can you make money at? Yes. And sometimes it may not even be a music. It might be some non-music thing to make you money, and then you have art. You have your art on the side. Right. And that's completely fine because not everyone is wired to do teaching. Uh, we talked about that. That is absolutely I mean, true. That is absolutely true. So you have a lot of patience, and right. it's really exhausting if you really give it your all. Mm-hmm. So after I teach all day. Because I've got two, you know, heavy part-time college jobs. I teach yeah. at North Central College in Naperville now. The last North Central, my, I don't my, think I'm my fifth that. year. I direct okay. the big band there and teach jazz from all lessons, and it's fun. Awesome. It's awesome. a whole different thing than Paul. Right. But it's it's hard. I get home, you know, six thirty, seven o'clock, and I'm exhausted. Right. So I'm trying to pretend like I can still play the trombone. Right. 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 Too tired, <laughs> too tired to go out and hear my friends play. Too tired to go yes. sit in somewhere, and of course, much less go play a gig. Right. A lot of times, so you have to you know that I'm old. I have to rest and <laughs> get prepared for the next day. I understand. You know, and sure, we're still practice. Oh, got to man. You gotta stay sharp, man. But some days I'll teach all day, 
and then I realized, geez, I played about 20 minutes today. I mm. got to go practice. Right. You know, and playing a, a few things with the students, not practicing. It's just no, 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 I hear you. Absolutely. So, but you just got to make it happen yourself and figure out, you know, what you like to do and then try to find people who do that and, and model them. Mm -hmm. You know, like you mentioned Joe Clark, our, my good friend, and he's yeah. a great big band writer. Mm -hmm. So maybe you like to do big band writing. He teaches arranging composition at, at Northwestern, but he's also teaching some uh, theory classes at Paul. Or Tom Mando, one of my best friends at Paul, is an incredible big band writer. Mm -hmm. So you start hanging out with those guys and trying to figure out what they do and understand their writing assignments to get to make money. Right. It's not always artistic. You know, your job can, can pay well, right. but it's not always artistic. So then you start to understand what what's the money stuff and what's the art stuff, and you try to you try to get to where you're making money doing the artistic stuff. Right. That's always the challenge. You know. Definitely. Getting paid money to play nice music mm -hmm. and play with your friends. You mentioned that. And that's a big part of it too. You, you establish relationships with people, and that's who hires you. And that's who you play with. Your friends. Right. It makes perfect sense. Yeah. Once in a while, I'll sub for my students in a band, mm -hmm. and I'll be the oldest dude in the band. Yeah, of course. Years, yeah, right, 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 right. You're looking around like, yeah, I did that, but yeah. Hey, hey Professor Crop. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, glad yeah. you have the gig. Absolutely. Have work, and it's, Absolutely. It's cool. They're, everybody sounds good. Mm -hmm. But you know, it's the dynamic is that it's a band of thirty to thirty-five year old people, not right. somebody my age. Right. And I just sort of laugh, do the best I can. And, well, you know what? It, you know what's, what, what's probably, at least in my eyes, what's cool about that for you is. You get to see that a what you're doing is still going on for sure. You know, because I, I know that I am getting a little old. I'm 30, so I am getting a little older now, and I'm like, man, I hope people keep playing jazz. You know, okay. at least how, however, however it's going to manifest itself 30 years from now. <laughs> I just hope that you know, like it, the tradition keeps going because I know what it, I know what it meant to me, and I know what it means musically for the world of music for this yeah. art form. Of all music, not 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 just jazz. I don't want to say jazz, but like for this thing to just keep moving forward, you know, and for us to keep teaching and reaching young people, yeah. you know. So the, I guess being there, you're looking around like, okay, there's some cats are still practicing. Oh no, no, you know? no. yeah, very much, especially here in Chicago. Right, I right. Think, you know, um, living in New York has gotten too expensive. I mean, it's unbelievable. So like, I think a yeah. lot of these players mm -hmm. who 25 years ago would have gone to New York. They didn't go there. They came here, right, from Cincinnati or University of Illinois or right. other other Midwest cities, and they've landed here. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I can't believe the level of young players here, the talent, how many of them are. I know they, they seem to be very, very motivated. Absolutely, they're man. working very hard at their thing. And a lot of them have other day jobs they're doing. Mm -hmm. You know, that's not on the resume or the website. Doesn't list their dog walking business. Sure. But then they're writing charts. And they got a great band. They're playing and they're doing stuff. And you go here and play, and they sound fantastic. And it's right. Like, wow, it's really something. So you got to you got to try to figure out the money part, you know, to do the art part. And it's not always so easy. Man, I I am living that life right now. Yeah, but, but lot, lots of people like you are. Yeah, it, it's not easy. It's it's not. You know, there's something as 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 frustrating as it is. There's something oddly romantic about it. You know, like I can talk to you about it because you get it, but like I tell somebody else, no, like, you're an idiot. <laughs> like just, you. just go get a fine degree or something. Go get yeah, a job. <laughs> Your life will be much easier. What is wrong with you? Yeah, man. You know what, man? You know, I I don't want to give a personal advice. I try to explain yeah. my wife and I are self employed, so right? Like, and we're old, mm -hmm. and we make we're so successful, we make too much money, so our health insurance premiums are just like oh, really? You can't even imagine. Oh man, well, so more than the mortgage. Yeah, that sucks, man. Yeah, so you know, if you try to explain to them, you're like, mm -hmm. you're just doing a damn job. What's yeah. wrong with you? And it's like, oh, well, it's not that easy. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's ridiculous. So I stopped trying to explain this to people. <laughs> you're right. You know, but it's, it's crazy. But I think enough people, you, it's a, it's, it becomes a calling and you don't have a choice. You don't. And music has found you. Right. I, I found this, <laughs> my, my friend. Suck his fucking claws into you. My, my friend jokes about this. Terrible oh, that this decision you made as a child yeah. has wrecked your life. You right. I mean? No, that's real. But you, you fall in love with it, and I love playing. I went to you know music camp in middle school, and I went all through high school, and just had a great time. And you know I couldn't could never have imagined doing anything else. You, you know what your problem is right now is you you're doing all these camps, and you run into all these young people, and their their youthful exuberance is constantly rubbing off on you. Hopefully. So you just get warped every time, yeah, you know right. what I mean? It's just like, oh man, sure. no man, look at that. He's trying to make it happen. It looks like me, you know, when I was that age. And it's just like, right. I have to, because yeah. you feel, 
you feel like you said you feel the call you know what i mean right. you're just like oh man this is this is what i'm supposed to be doing because you'll go through two weeks and it's like man f this and then you get a, a week of, of of good lessons you know or you'll go do the abersol camp and then you're with your friends and you know you get a halfway decent check i imagine it's like sure it's worth it and you get sucked back you get sucked back right. in man yeah if it's a very mental and physical uh, thing yeah, and you can get worn out. So absolutely, you, you have to you have to learn how to pace yourself and right. get some rest. And, right, because it, it, you know it's hard. So luckily, just had summer break mm -hmm. from teaching other than camp. So right, I, I was appreciative to have the break. But yeah, so school's starting back up, and I, I feel like I'm ready to get it rolling again. Yeah, man. So to midterms. That's <laughs> <laughs> me about the middle of September. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. It's like oh, I didn't practice. And I had so much going on. It's just like. Yeah. God damn it, dude. Yeah. No, man, I'm a professor. Right, yeah. exactly. Beats up students. Right. <laughs> That's fantastic, man. You got anything else you want to uh, broach or any shout outs you want to give, man? No, I, I I was actually thinking about this a few years ago. I, I played some gigs in Indianapolis. Mm -hmm. and I, you know, I still go down there and see some old friends of mine. Yeah. I played at the Indianapolis Jazz Festival a couple times. It was mm -hmm. a great, great event. But I was just very grateful I ended up in Chicago because the level here is so high. Yeah, definitely. And it's helped my own playing and my own teaching. And um, so I, it's a really a high-level situation. And I, yes. one of the students at DePaul was pointing out that he thinks Chicago is like the second biggest jazz scene in the country and, and the highest level a, out, outside of New York. Yeah. I don't know what the scene is like in L.A. I feel like it's a little bit more pop R&B, but... It's probably that, and I think a lot of the horn players you both we both would know their names. Right. Their their money stuff is all the movie days and the motion picture days, right. and that's like serious mm -hmm. adult six figure income for the year kind of stuff. So right. the jazz stuff, even if they're really good at it, definitely takes a back seat because mm -hmm. everybody's going to pay as much money. Right. 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 So, but there's some mind boggling virtuoso instrumentalists. Oh, without question. Just, you know, just amazing. Without question. So. But your love for it will carry you through. Just, just keep at it, keep practicing. Yeah. So, thanks, it. man. I needed to hear that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, because I gotta go home and finish working on these charts. Literally, when there we get go. done with this, there so I'm go. just like, man, this shit better work out. <laughs> this better work out. All right, Tim, I appreciate it, guys. I hope you guys really enjoyed that interview because I know I did. Uh, it'll go up soon. I hope you guys check out the other stuff. I'll link Tim's uh, website and maybe throw your email down there. So if you're looking for a trombone or maybe just a teacher of any kind, definitely check him out. Hopefully you will do that. As you can see, he's such a nice guy, man. <laughs> such a nice guy. Um, Tim, thanks, man. Thank you. I appreciate Thanks it. Man. This was wonderful. Yeah, man. Me too. Me too. I had a lot of fun too. All right, guys. Take it easy. See you next time.